everyone, and welcome to Paranormal Roundtable. I'm your host, Josh Turner, and with me, as always, are my trusty companions... Anthony and Mushu. Anthony and Mushu. And th- I guess we're going to start calling him Anthony and Mushu because it's Anthony and Tony, and everybody thinks that Tony is short for Anthony. It's just easier, I guess. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of what we started saying, <laughs> having a nickname for me. But Anthony's real name is actually not Anthony, it's Mario. Yeah, and your yeah. name is Tony, but I mean, we call Anthony Anthony because it's a familiar. Yeah, Anthony's name. already his nickname, I guess, in yeah. a way. <laughs> so they even just, they even started calling me Tony and him Mushu. So, dude. It's, just, it, dude, it's all over the place, dude. The place. I can't keep track it of it from so day weird. to day. Not to mention my multiple names. That I thought I have you were going to start calling yourself T Mac. Are you not going to call yourself that, Tony? No, no, that's that's just for my personal life. Oh, your personal <laughs> life. Okay, all right. That's for the dating scene. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. T Mac. Uh, That's what Banjo calls me. That's is it what Banjo calls you? Uh, well, okay, so folks, here's what we got going on real quick here. We got Paranormal Roundtable, Josh Turner at PRTPodcast.com, Josh Turner at PRTPodcast.com. That's the coordinates to send me your stories. Now, if you want to be friends on Facebook, make sure that you let me know that you are a listener of the show so I can approve you. Josh Turner 940 on Instagram. Follow me on Instagram, folks. Josh Turner 940. I, I'm on Instagram and... Um, Check out check out my Instagram page. I think I, I think I'm pretty hot on there. I look, I look pretty hot, you know. Got all the live posts, especially in the summertime when I'm walking around. And I'm all sweating from <laughs> the heat. I'm pretty hot and tempting, folks. Uh, <laughs> my my uh, he doesn't sweat. He glistens. He gl- glisten. My Instagram is uh, PRT Mushu, and on there is also pretty hot. I take pictures of different peppers. So. <laughs> Actually, those little ones your mom had. They're pretty Woo! crazy, they're, right? They're hot, but they're so tasty. They're so good. They, they go with everything. everything. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Tell your mom. She I grows eat, them I herself. I love those. Those are so good. I used to eat the something very similar to those. They were chili paquin, but the, those are totally different. Those are good. So, um, so Anthony, what what is it about the PRT? Um, Patreon. Patreon. Tell us about that. We have the PRT Patreon going on. Uh, we've had it for a while now. You can find it at patreon.com slash PRT podcast. We have four tiers on there. We have a 10, 20, 30, and $40 tier. If you sign up for any of the tiers, you're, you're, you're going to get your name as a credit at the beginning and, and end of all of our videos on YouTube. As a producer. Yeah, as a producer. If you sign up for a $10 tier, after three months, you're going to get a swag bag, a book, a hat, and some stickers, and just a sorted variety of PRT merch. If you want to get that bag immediately, you can sign up for the 20, 30 or $40 tier. And you just send us a message on Patreon and say, Hey, I signed up for Patreon. Um, I'm this tier. Uh, I, I wear this size shirt and this is my mailing address. And please make sure you do that because when you sign up for that tier, um, we have to know your shirt size and we have to know your address. Okay. And uh, the, so otherwise, we can't send it to you. Somebody was like, I haven't gotten my stuff. And I'm like, you haven't sent me any, yeah. <laughs> any address. Me send your stuff. Oh, um, and, and the bigger your tier, the bigger your swag bag is going to be. Each tier is going to get uh, more stuff. So Yeah, it's just going to improve and improve and improve. And uh, if you guys you know, are trying to look for that and you guys are trying to find it later on in the show and you don't want to find it, you can always remember to just... Check the description of every YouTube video. We have everything that you guys need right there. Um, we keep them all right there for every video. Yep. And trust me, you're going to get more than your money's worth with that swag bag. Yeah. It's going to be nice. The, the $20 tier is very simple. You get a hat or a shirt uh, and a book. And then now the $30 tier, we give you two books with, from assorted authors like Nick Redfern. And all these books are autographed, by the way. Yeah. Autographed by Nick Redfern, Lyle Blackburn, Ken Gerhard, whatever. Now, if you get a $40 tier, once my books come in, you'll get two books, one from me and then one from one of many other authors. Uh, But here's the thing. If you're going to go for the $50 tier, I'll give you both of my books and I'll give you another book from one of many other authors and a sweatshirt or a hoodie and a hat. And then, of course, you'll get keychains, you'll get stickers, and that'll happen with the $30 and $40 tier, too. But you'll only get two books, and then the $40 tier, you'll get one of my books. $50 tier, you get both of my books. And we're going to create that $50 tier. Um, But that hasn't hasn't been done yet, but it will be. We're, We're in the works of figuring out how to do all this. We thank everyone that supports the show because we are growing. We're trying to grow. 
and we have a lot of projects uh, coming up, a lot of irons in the fire. I have a UAP project coming up along with uh, my next book that I'm going to be working on, which is going to be about haunted houses and the phenomena surrounding that. Now, my books are out. They dropped, okay? Uh, the do- werewolves and dogman, uh, werewolves and the dogman phenomena and the Bigfoot phenomena are both available on Amazon. Uh, or you can go to the conference and get them at the conference and get them autographed from me. I won't be sending any autographed copies out until after the conference because our books literally won't be coming in until August 27th or 28th. Mm-hmm. So it'll be just in time for the conference. And a little nervous, cutting it a little close. <laughs> we get them in, yeah, you know, we in get time. them in at the 11th hour. Yeah, yeah we don't have to so, go up to the post office and start throwing hands. Yeah, but we couldn't rush. We couldn't rush it. We had to We had to get them, make sure they were correct, and uh, fine-tooth comb everything and make sure it was right. We had to go back and redo the, the werewolf book because it wasn't completely correct the way we wanted it. And then we had to do the same thing with the Bigfoot book. So... Now that they're done and they're in print, uh, people are buying them, snatching them up like hotcakes. Uh, check out the books, okay? They're they're written a little differently because I was like two thirds of the way through the Dogman book, and I think I was a little more loose with the Bigfoot book, but I, and I went into way more detail with each witness, and I think that's going to be the future of how I write will be that. I think I was a little stiff with the Dogman book, but I'm criticizing myself. You check it out though. A lot of people are telling me I'm getting good reviews, telling me that it's good and it's scary. Um, I wasn't trying to scare the crap out of people, but the subject is a scary subject. So it is what it is. You definitely felt a little bit more inspired. I feel like during the Bigfoot book, um, like I feel like you're still trying to get your bearings from what I could tell from the Dogman book, mm-hmm. even though like everybody even though everybody like and myself agree that you did really well on it. When people read that Bigfoot book, I think they're going to be blown away because yeah. that's definitely how I felt. Yeah. And, and I, I'm proud of the both books. I, I think I did okay for the first time for the first, you know, but I really put a lot more into the Bigfoot book um, because it was just, you know, first time I did this with the dog man. And so now the Bigfoot is just, it's, it's just a, you know, it's only going to get better. I'm going to, I'm going to get better folks. Don't worry. And, uh, we're just going to keep putting material out there and we're, we're talking to witnesses every day. I'm proud to say that today I had about four phone calls, but yesterday I had 11. Mm. I counted 11, 11 phone calls, which seven of which were witnesses. So that's, uh, that's pretty, it's a pretty good haul. Got some good stories and I've read, I think in the last two days, or last three days, 36 emails, which is, or, or 36 emails that were show worthy, which is literally 12 a day. Um, those didn't all come in three days, but I thought this is such a, a jump from when we first started. Mm. You know, we were getting three or four stories a week and now we're getting like a hundred. Yeah, I mean, in, like, in the beginning we were pretty much relying on your just, just your memory. Yeah. It well, was just like your stories. Like what did you have to bring what's, up? What, what happened to me mm-hmm. and then stories that were told to me from the past and then we brought on witnesses from the house that we lived in mm-hmm. and whatever. And I And I had a pretty good collection of stories from over the years. Uh, that I had gathered because fortunately for the audience and, and myself and everybody involved, I had written in, in multiple journals. I had um, lots and lots of encounters from people that had given me encounters and I wrote them down. Uh, and so that's basically what we used. And, you know, and it was, it was my old co-host that said, Hey, you need to use, when I showed him those, he was like, you need to use these, the, you know, these people are giving you these stories and you've collected them. You need to, to make a show a podcast. And, uh, I had used up a lot of my really good dog man stuff, but by the time I was telling those stories on another channel, I was getting more and more people sending me their stories. And then it just went from there. And now here we are. Um, and now this, this episode, we're going to talk about, a subject we've covered before, but it's just so weird to me. And and I felt kind of inspired. I, you know, my friends over at uh, Expanded Perspectives, I was watching their show the other day and my wife had it up and I think she had been watching it and it was about time slips. So go check out Expanded Perspectives. I've been on their show. They're really good guys, uh, Kyle and, and, and Cam, and they're going to be at the conference too for Expanded Perspective guys, very, very nice guys. Uh, Kyle had reached out to me yesterday about the conference. One of the things that 
I thought was interesting. I only listened to a couple of, of the stories on that particular episode, but I, I went to my study and I sat down and I started looking up stories that I had labeled alternate reality or time slips or glitches in the matrix. Cause those are my files that I use for this. And so I came up with several really good um, stories. Some of them are a little shorter, but I think they're all, all the ones I picked out. I think they're all like, like show worthy. And I'll tell you right now, I'll start with this one. This one happened in Seoul, Korea. And this person is a, a, an American citizen who, was born here, but went back to visit his grandmother. He's a Korean uh, by by national by nationality. He's American, but he's Korean. You know that's his heritage. He went back home to visit his grandmother in Seoul. Now Seoul is a very large city. I mean, the, these cities in, in Asia and I mean, they absolutely dwarf these American cities. Yeah, like, yeah, know, they don't mess around. They're um, humongous. The people are just dude. packed in. It's, it's just, just it's crazy how big they are, and so. He he was in Seoul, and now imagine walking down a busy street. You go in, you get a bowl of of food to eat, right? Is what he did. He's like, and I'm sitting there eating, you know, and just eating my noodles, not not paying attention. And I look around, and he's like, everybody's just uh, stopped. And, and so I, I asked him. I said, "What do you mean?" At that point, because I read the, the whole story, and then I went back and I you know how I do it. And I asked a different talking point. I, I said, I said, I said, okay, first of all, what do you mean by stopped? Because that point right there, he kind of went forward and kept talking. And he said, I got up and I moved around the restaurant and he's like, I thought something was wrong with my mind. And then I thought, you know, he is a Christian. He thought maybe this is the rapture, you know, like <laughs> he was freaking out. Like he didn't know what to do. Like he was like, Oh my gosh. And then he started, you know, so I said, when he said people stopped, I, I was like, what does that mean? And like, like, and he goes, they, they weren't moving. Like they were absolutely still. And I said, did you, did they stop or did they slow down? Cause that's two different things. Because sometimes people will tell you that they hit this sort of glitch or whatever. And it's like people slow down, but it's really, you know, that's not what's happening. They say they stop, but that's actually not what's happening. They're just moving really slow. And so he, he did tell me, he said, no, no, no. They, they were completely motionless. Like, like, like one girl had her arm up in her right arm. It was literally, it was up to her face. Like she was about to take a bite of food and he walked around the restaurant. He thought, this is, this is incredible. And he asked me if I'd ever heard of anything like this. And I said, yes, I have. Actually, I've heard of this multiple times. Um, I went around different groups and I gathered some stories together from people who had said that they had had glitches, time slips, or gone into alternate realities. So these weren't all people that came to me and said, hey, I listen to your show. Check it out. No, I, I hustled these stories up. But I told this guy. And I'll call him uh, Kim. I asked him, I said, Kim, can you tell me, um, you know, like when that happened, I was like, you, why do you think you were the only one that was still moving around? Right. And he says, I don't know. He goes, but then later on that evening, he goes, I, I was so freaked out. I left my food. I got up and I walked out. He goes, when I get outside, I start to see everybody speed up real quick. And it was like, Somebody had hit the fast forward. Like he was catching up. Yeah. And then it, and then everybody moved real fast and then they were moving around again like normal. And he thought, dude, something's wrong. Well, he went home. He told his grandmother what happened. She's like, oh my gosh, something's wrong with your brain. You need to go get help. So she like forced the issue, him and his aunt, her and her, his aunt who he went over there with, and they forced him to go to the doctor. And so he's over there. He's like, he's like sitting there, and they they gave him a physical, and there's like he's 27 year old guy. They're like, you're perfectly healthy, you know. He's he's you know he's 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 a smart guy. He's got a degree. Um, I think he went to Georgetown for his degree, but uh, he was saying he goes, dude, I don't know what the heck happened. I don't know what was going on. He said that he was talking to his great uncle. And when he told his great uncle what happened, his great uncle says, where were you when this happened? He told him exactly the neighborhood and the noodle house where he was at. And he said one time when he was 17, 
Now, his great uncle, of course, he's he's older now. You know, he's in his 70s. But he said when he was 17 years old, he was walking down the, ro- the, the street and he bent down to pick up a coin. And when he did, he said, dude, it was so weird. It was about a block and a half from where he had his experience. He said, when I went to pick up the coin, it sat up and started to kind of spin. And then when he looked around, he noticed that everybody was moving really slow, like like their arms and legs were just like barely moving. And so there was a distinction there between what his great uncle happened. happened. He said it was real quick and then it was over like boom. So it was two very similar experiences in the same area, but not exactly. No. You know what I mean? This wasn't something that was like, you know, like, oh, I had the exact same thing happen to me. No, it was very similar. Here's another weird thing. When his uncle looked down, the coin that was spinning was now gone. It was just gone. And then everybody began to move like normal, like kind of quick for a second, and then they were moving normal again. And so I asked him, I said, have you thought about maybe going into the restaurant and talking to the people who run the establishment? And he says, no, I hadn't thought about that. And I said, well, let me give you some homework. Go do that and <laughs> find out. And he's like, well, I'm not. I'm back in the States, you know? And I said, well, next time you go to Korea, can you, he goes, I'll do you one better. He goes, my cousin lives there. And he's like, so I had her go in there and kind of do a little investigative journalism. And she actually got to talk to one of the owners. There's a husband and wife that own that establishment. And the wife was very forthcoming. She says, look, She's like, this is area is very, you know, high strangeness. And, and so, and she literally said it that way. <laughs> she literally told him, and she says, he didn't speak very good English. And his cousin is there and she's learning English. She's going to school there, born in America, but decided to go back to Korea. And, and there's a thriving industry there, businesses. I mean, a lot of, it's growing. It's becoming super duper. Uh, it's becoming one of the leading countries in Asia when it comes to technology and a lot, it's caught up very quickly in just in three or four decades. Yeah, Samsung's a Korean company. Yeah. Uh, and Kia's, you know, I remember when yeah. Kia's weren't nothing. Now oh, they're yeah, in, Kia's really up their game big time. Well, and Kia's going to, we're going to talk about Kia in a minute here too. Uh, so his cousin went there and she said that this woman told her, she said, there's a lot of weird stuff that happens here. And she said one time she was, this is what the, the, the owner of the restaurant told her. One time she was, when they first opened, she was scrubbing the pot. And she looked over and she said, oh, this is kind of creepy. She sees this woman standing there. They have these swinging doors that go into the kitchen, right? She looks over and she sees this woman standing there and she says, can you help me? You know, and she turns and she looks and she's like, what's wrong? And she she just says like, she sees blood coming out of her right ear on, on her face. And then she turns around and she sees what looks like a hole on the back side of her skull, like something had happened. And then she just vanished. So that was weird. So then she tells her that they have had m- multiple people in that area. And then in the two places next door, um, they had people saying that they had seen full bodied apparitions like ghosts, right? Well, it turns out that that area right there where that used to be was a hub for gangsters. And that used to be like a garage area where they stored like stolen stuff and then eventually the police cleaned it out and what they ended up doing was the 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 people some new people bought it and they revamped it and turned it into like a noodle house and then next door there's like a little shop and then there's like a cell phone repair place and so on you know what i mean but multiple people had been possibly taken out you know what i mean they were unalived and so that may be what contributed to it and his great uncle had told him, yes, there was an air, that area there was kind of bad at one time. They kind of gentrified it, but it was literally a, 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 like a hangout for gangsters, kind of a lawless area. So I don't know if that has anything to do with it or maybe it creates like a rift or something, but uh, that that's a really weird story. And I told him if you ever go back, which he's planning on doing uh, this coming fall, I said, anything weird happens, let me know. You know, and he did give me a a, a pretty uh, freaky ghost story that his grandmother had told him from when she was a child. Now, I'm only going to throw this one in there because even though it's about alternate realities, this isn't really about ghosts, but it's all related, right? So his grandmother said that when she was a child, they had 
what they called an evil spirit, I guess. Um, there's a name for it. I'm not going to try to pronounce it, but it, it's, it's a Korean, like a, like kind of like a demon. And if you're a child and you are disobedient to your parents, well, then this particular creature or whatever comes out from under the bed and it can literally, it'll, it'll mess with your feet and it'll bite your feet. Right. And so she thought this is bull crap. So she didn't believe it. So she was jumping on the bed. Her and her two sisters were jumping on the bed and their brother ran and told, you know, brothers, they love to tell their sisters and vice versa. Uh, Tony knows that. So she, he runs in there and tells, then the, the mom comes in there and says, you, you guys need to go to bed. This is bull crap. What are you doing? And if you keep jumping up and down the bed, I'm gonna give you a spanking. And she says, okay. So they laid down, they went to sleep. Well, she decided to be s- sneaky and look at one of her books. She was a seven-year-old kid, and she was like, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. And she was kind of the rebellious one. Um, no sooner had she uh, broken the rules than this entity or whatever came up. She sees this weird hand, and it was like solid brown. She said it was weird. It looked like not, not like a human hand, and it only had four fingers. And she said that it just reached up, and it grabbed her foot, and she get, and she set up so terrified And she sat up and she looked and then she sees this brown little troll looking thing with, with its eyes were real far apart. Um, She said it was weird. It almost looked like, and it had a really wide mouth and it was just grinning and the mouth was so wide that it didn't have ears, but where the ears should have been, that's how far the mouth was. And she said that if she had, he said that she told him that it was about a, the head was about a foot and a half wide, but it had really spindly looking limbs and it looked to be a male creature, right? But it did have a clothing. But all she saw was like this little vest with no shirt or anything. And so she said that she um, just stared at it in horror. And then it opened its mouth and it went to bite her foot. And she said as it was just about to bite onto her foot, she screamed. And her mother came in there with a belt <laughs> and gave her a spanking. But she was so happy. She said, like, I've never been so happy to have a spanking in my life. And then after that, she's like, I went to bed, said my prayers. I didn't mess around. No more sitting up looking at that at, at, at books and playing around and whatever. She's like, I was in bed and, and I was just there asleep. As when it was time to go to bed, she said that she made it a point like never again. And she never saw the creature again. Now, she claims that her brother did. But once they moved from that particular place, neither one of them ever had any encounters with anything after that. Pretty much so, just quelled her rebellious spirit immediately. Yeah. Huh? Well, that took care of that. She was just like, <laughs> you know, I'm done uh, playing around and misbehaving. But anyway, uh, thank you, Kim, for those stories. And that's uh, very appreciati- appreciated. And if you have any more travels to Korea, because actually me and Tony have been talking about doing um, a show about Korea because we did Strange Demons of Japan and we were going to do other Asian countries. And then we got sidetracked with a million other things, including work, you know. Um, and so, yeah, when you're bogged down dealing with all that, you can't get to it. But we are planning on doing one about Korea. Yeah, I'm definitely. And what I think happened, though, more than likely, is that they just have amazing noodles. And when he ate those noodles, <laughs> it stopped time. Magic noodles. Magic noodle time. That should be the, like their a slogan for, oh, for like a noodle, for like a food, a food product. So good it stops time. <laughs> <laughs> Just so you have more time to enjoy. Well, and here's another one. And and and, and I was going to, there's another one about a restaurant, but I'm going to save that one. I'm going to do this one. This guy, he's from Wells. And he actually, this happened in uh, Northern uh, uh, England th- th- where this happened. He was driving down the highway. And this isn't a real long story, but he he's Welsh and his wife is actually Scottish. <laughs> But they were in, they're British, basically, and they were in- Too hard people to understand. (laughs) Well, they were in Northern England, and they were driving down the road, and him and his wife were in an argument. It happens. I'm married, believe me, I know. Nelly always starts uh, stuff with me. Um, Me, I'm perfectly innocent. I don't really do anything wrong. You better hurry up and apologize for that. Just go ahead before (laughs) she starts somewhere now. Don't don't take it too far before you say, just kidding. Uh, I'm already looking around for her. (laughs) Just kidding, honey. I'm joking. I'm always in the wrong. You know that. Whew, finally. Okay. All right. <laughs> so, so what ended up happening? They were arguing and his wife's like, watch the road. And he's like, I'm watching the road. Okay. You watch, you watch yourself. Like you just, you know, it's going back and forth. He's like, and then all of a sudden they notice that the, t- that the there's a truck in front of them, 
like a big truck, like like a like a construction truck, and this humongous tire just comes flying off of the back of that truck, and they see these sparks, and it was just crazy. And then they see the tire just bouncing, and it is like as tall as their car, and it's heading, it's barreling right toward their car. Well, he goes to swerve, and then he goes, and this is where it gets weird. He's like, it was like. I was moving in slow motion. He goes, and I was like trying to control, but I, he goes, and this isn't one of those things, the way he described this to me, his name's Kent. He he described it to me that it was like the way he was turning the wheel. He goes, I was moving in slow motion. He goes, my brain was still working fast. I look over my wife and her mouth is like, no, you know, like that. And they both experienced this together. They both literally slowed down. Their bodies were slowed down. But he said that he had time to react. So he starts to turn the wheel, but it was like going so slow. And he could see the tire bouncing up and down, up and down. And that it was about to come right through their wind or go into the windshield, you know, and kill them both. And he just, the car just turned, turned, turned. And he's like, okay, the tire's getting closer. Tires getting closer. He goes, I don't know what this is, whether it's God or whatever, you know, but I'm, it's, I'm, this is going to save me. And so he was able to move out of the way. The tire just kind of grazed over the side of his car and went behind him and then went between two more cars miraculously and then rolled and went off the road, not hurting anyone. Um, but it, it, it took, like he said, like probably five or six minutes. For this to happen, something that should have just taken a few seconds and then boom, you're not alive anymore. And he, he said, dude, if that thing would have hit us, we would have been gone. He said, we weren't driving a really, really big car. They ran off the road. And then he's like, we, we go, we, I turn the wheel and get back onto the road. And then all of a sudden we're back to full speed and I'm driving past this truck and he goes, and we survived. We lived. It was amazing. Um, and he said, but all rights, we should be dead. There's no reason why I should be talking to you right now. I mean, it's crazy. And he's like, as I it was, was him typing an email. He goes, but while I'm typing this email, I'm thinking, I'm thank God that I'm alive. One thing it did do though, was reaffirm his faith. And now he goes to church like religiously twice a week. And I said, that's good. At least you did that. And then he doesn't know what it is. He doesn't know what it, what happened. But his wife did say something. This is interesting. His wife saw something different than what he saw. His wife saw a whitish, yellowish light envelop their vehicle and them. And when she looked over at them, she saw this sort of like color prism kind of around his head. And she saw a yellowish white light, which I think he was too busy driving. I don't think he noticed it. He didn't pay attention. But she saw it. She looks over. She says, and it was such a weird feeling to not be able to control your body. And it's like something else is controlling your body. And she's like, I'm thinking at a hundred percent speed, but I'm not able to react, you know? And she's like, Kent's trying to get us off the road. And I'm looking over and I'm like, what's going on? You know, I can't control my movement, my body. It's like, I'm stuck in some sort of, you know, whatever. And she's like, it was the weirdest feeling. I, I couldn't, she's like, I can't explain it, you know, unless it happens to you, you know? And it's weird. I actually talk to her briefly, um, like just maybe 10, 15 minutes. And she explained that part of it, but I only talked to him through the email, uh, and because he was at work, but it was interesting to me though. Like she said, the way she said that, that they had, you know, this miraculous event, they think it was like a miracle, right? Because he, that white light kind of sounds like a guardian angel or yeah, something. Yeah, I was thinking that or something that took over and and did. Now, here's an interesting thing. She said, I don't know what my higher purpose was. This was She was 32 when this happened. Now she's like, you know, 56 or 50. Uh, or no, no, she's 58. So this happened years ago, right? Like 22 years ago. And she said that she thinks that maybe there was a reason for it because her their granddaughter literally was drowning in a neighbor's pool. And she's like, I bolt upright. And she's like, my, my daughter and my son-in-law lived like three blocks down the street. And she goes, and I got up and I took off running down the road because I had a, like a, a, a dream. You know, I, I just dreamed that she was screaming. And so the, her granddaughter 
Um, I think she said her name was Chelsea, but she took off down the road. She's like, Chelsea's in trouble. So she runs down the road and she literally kicks like th- they had a lock on their back fence. She's like, man, I did a Bruce, her exact words. She's like, I did a Bruce Lee kick, kick the fence in and I run and there she is in the backyard, uh, six years old, supposedly being watched by a babysitter who's in there playing video games and doing something illegal you know, ingesting something into her lungs that's illegal. And she's so infuriated, but she doesn't have time to be worried about that. She could literally see her through the glass door. She jumps in the pool and grabs the child out and saves her. And uh, she thinks, you know, maybe, you know, that's what, that's what she needed to, that's what happened. Like she had to save her granddaughter. And, and I think she said that was like 12 years ago. Or something like that. And her granddaughter's now graduating high school um, and she's going into medicine. And I said, well, maybe she's going to cure cancer or something. I don't know. Maybe that was what the, the, this guardian angel that you said, that's what I was thinking. Like, maybe that's what caused her, you know, and, and we packed all that into like a, I think a 15 minute conversation. And then we're like, okay, you know, and that was it. She's like, okay, well, I got to go pick up my husband for work because oddly enough, <laughs> when they were driving, get this. One of the tires came off of their vehicle. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. And so they, it's in the shop. They're no worse for wear for that. But they, she's like, yeah. And she's like, it's really, it's really weird. But uh, I thought that was very interesting. And I thought that that would be a good story uh, for this particular episode. Now, if you stop and you analyze this and you look at it, it's really hard to explain what's going on here um, with like her and her husband and with what happened to Kim. Like, what is this? You know, what are we dealing with here? And before you say, oh, well, those are just two isolated incidents, let me give you another one. Now, this one actually hits close to home because this one happened, uh, and you guys know Trulux, right? Yeah. I like Trulux. I like the one downtown in particular. It's actually a very good place to eat. Um, if you can see. Huh? If you could look and see in there. It's always so dark. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Well, th- I, you know, the one up here, I think, is a little darker, the one at the Arboretum. Um, we, we, we started going to Eddie V's and that be, kind of became our place. And now we go to Freda's, but they're all three good. Um, and the true Lux down, downtown is, was the original. And, uh, I used to have a friend of mine that liked to go there like once a week or whatever. And I used to go and eat, eat there sometimes. And, um, he was a, a friend of mine that owned a nightclub and, uh, now he's got another business, but, uh, I asked him one day, we were just kind of talking and here's, here's a weird thing. He's like into ghosts and stuff like that. And y'all know who I'm talking about. Um, he, he told me that one time when he was at True Lux, this is, a, this is before I tell you the other weird stuff, right? He said a guy came up to him and all them buildings downtown are haunted, right? He said a guy came up and said, you know, would you like w- uh, something to start, drink, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And they said, yeah. And they told him what they wanted. The guy walked off. Well, it was, a very, it was very busy. He said, and it was like a Friday night, very busy. That's the, the night that waiters will tell you. If you've been in the service industry, don't go out to eat on a Friday night because everybody's, you know, everybody's trying to eat that. And, and these waiters are slammed. And if you do, then be courteous and be, and be okay with waiting, okay? You're out there to eat. Don't go on a Friday night and be like, well, I got to get my food now because that's not how it works. And make sure you tip right. And tip right too, please. So anyway, th- this waiter disappears. And him and his wife, the, uh, the, the wife that he was with at the time, he's, he's, they're, they're now with different people. He's got another wife and a, and a child with us. This was years ago, like 20 years ago. And he says, so I'm sitting there and, and, I, and I'm waiting for this person to come back with our drinks. And I'm thinking, dang, this is taking a long time. Finally, this, this young lady comes up and she says, well, can I take your order? And he's like, well, yeah, I just uh, gave this guy my drink order or whatever. And she's like, oh, oh, oh okay. Is somebody waiting on you? And he's like, yeah. Tall, thin, blonde haired, or sandy blonde haired, whatever. And she's like, uh, let me go see what's going on with that. And she's like, but in the meantime, can I get you your drink? So he says, well, I'll give you the drink order. And if, you know, so she comes back and she's like, okay, this is only like my fourth day here. And apparently that is somebody who no longer works here. And he was like, uh, okay. So then he just finishes the meal. Goes back the next week. Like I said, he, he went there religious like every week. And I'd been there a couple times with him. And so he goes back and the next week and he asks the, he's talking to one of the man, the bar manager and he's waiting for a table. And he says, I had something really happen. Uh, this guy who came up to our table, 
Um, didn't really didn't remember his name. Didn't catch his name. He said, "I think it was like Sean or something like that." He couldn't remember. And the guy's like, "Wait a minute." He's like, "I know who you're talking about." And he goes, "That guy, he he, he doesn't work anymore. Um, he died recently." And he was like starting to tell him the hows and whys, and his wife got freaked out and was like, you know what? We're good. We don't want to know. And he goes, well, I want to know. And then he said that his wife was just so freaked out that they they left the restaurant. So I said, did you go back and ever ask that guy? He goes, no. When I went back the next time, you know, he's like, the, the, the bar manager guy wasn't there that next time. So I just let it go and I never talked about it again. I said, man, I wish you would have because we could have figured out what happened. But this guy obviously really liked his job because he was still there. Um, and or what, he had a really heartless boss who scheduled him even, he would have in, to yeah, <laughs> even in the afterlife. He's on the schedule. He's like, you didn't get two weeks permission for this, so you're going to go. Like uh, the office space that guy. sounds like the, um, the service industry. I never I'm got a note you about you dying. In. Yeah, you had. He's at the funeral talking to the casket. He's like, "Yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and need you to come in on Tuesday. That'd be great. That'd be what? great. <laughs> you could just do that for me. You could just go ahead and show up spectrally. That would be great. Okay. Well, so let me. So let me get to this. This story. Uh, this guy. Guys. Go, guys. Goes by the name of Gus. He told me this story. Now he's not from Austin. Uh, he is was living in Oregon, in Eastern Oregon. Um, who's, who he had for a, a long time had lived in Portland, then he relocated to Eastern Oregon and lives kind of on a, on a small little piece of ranch land. So they came down for a wedding and they had like a few uh, drinks, whatever, like a couple days after the wedding because the people are their friends. And so they said, hey, let's go eat some seafood. So they went to Trulux. Trulux is one of, like I said, three of the, there's three really good seafood places here. It's one of them. And so they, they went to go eat at True Lux downtown. They, they had first gone to Ruta Maya's. You remember the coffee place? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so they had gone there and they'd had some coffee. They went around the corner. They went to, to True Lux. They said, hey, let's go to True Lux or whatever. And uh, so they went in to eat and the weirdest thing happened. He was sitting there with his wife and his wife's friends who had just gotten married. Um, best friend that they had gone to college with at UT. And he said... This waiter was walking by and she had a bunch of plates. She was carrying a, a big stack of plates. She says she tripped and two or three plates started to fall. And he said at that moment, he looks over and he said that everything slowed down. Like time, everything was like going in slow motion. And two or three of the plates were just falling like one at a time. And he was like, oh my gosh, you know. The, the, all of these plates she was carrying were just going to come crashing down and they were going to hit their table and knock over all their stuff and their food. And so he leapt into action and he jumped up and he said, dude, but when it ha was happening, it was so slow. He goes, I felt like, you know, the flash, you know, he goes, it was like I had superpowers. He's like, I'm moving full speed and everybody around me has just slowed down to a crawl. He goes, even my wife's friend, she was in the middle of talking and her mouth was just barely moving. And he's like, I don't know what this is or what's happening, but he managed to 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 not only grab the plates, but then put them back on the, the, the in, in the woman's arms and then kind of reposition her a little bit. And he's like, you know, I don't know what's happening here, but I'm going to go with this, you know. And then he goes and he sits back down. And then like a few seconds later, it's like, whoa. And then she kind of stumbles, but doesn't drop the plates and then continues walking. And because... It, it it almost and she did bump into their table. She said, "Oh, I'm sorry, excuse me." And this is what's crazy. Well, not that that wasn't already crazy enough. He's on the ground, and everybody's around him, and they're like, "Gus, Gus, are you okay? Whatever, are you know, like like, are you okay?" And he's like, "The weirdest thing." He goes, I, I don't know how I did that because I sat back down on the chair and I was eager to tell everybody what had just happened. He's like, but I couldn't talk and I felt like I had just had a seizure. And so his wife was really concerned about him. So everything, he says, I'm fine. I'm fine. I don't need to go to the hospital. He gets up. Everything's fine. When they get back home to Oregon, she's like, I really want you to go see somebody about this, this episode where you ended up on the ground. And at that point, they hadn't really talked a whole lot about it. So he asks his wife, he says, what did you see? Because I saw a woman 
She's like, yes, I know. You've already told me. And he said he reiterated it to her. He's like, I saw a woman who had a bunch of plates and they were falling and I went and I tried to stop them. And she goes, yes, but that's not what we saw. We saw a woman trip, get her balance, and then you had fallen onto the ground. While we were watching her, you had fallen over and you were laying on the ground. So what happened? Like whose story is correct? I mean, like, was that their take on it? Or did he imagine? I mean, like, what Like, what is that? Like, I, I've tried so hard and to think about this and try to figure out. And he asked me what I thought. And it, I gave him my honest opinion. I said, first of all, I said, uh, I'm pretty sure that now that that's happened to you, Dogman's probably going to come after you along with Bigfoot and other kind of crypts. I'm joking. I didn't say that to him. Uh, but I did tell him, I think you're crazy and I hung up. I didn't tell him that either. Now, I, I didn't know what to tell him. I had no idea what to tell this guy. I was sitting there and I was just, you know, stumped. Well, folks, if you go back and you listen to the episode we did uh, on the live stream, we did a live stream, an impromptu live stream on a Saturday, which isn't usually what we do, but we did one and we decided that because we had a story and I really wanted to tell it and Anthony and me had talked about it, and it's it's the live stream number 145 on YouTube. If you go to YouTube, and if you're not watching us on YouTube with the live streams, you need to be. Live stream number 145, it's called Haunted Houses, Dogman, Nature of Reality. Now, that particular episode, it's really weird. It's like the guy lived in a haunted house, but it was more than just like a haunted house. He was like moving in and out of like alternate timelines, like reality. And one of the store one of the stories in that on that particular show i didn't have i didn't tell that story um when i got home and i looked on my computer then i saw that there was one story that was on there that was very interesting and it happened very similar and it involved him tossing a grapefruit up in the air um and like i said i'm not going to give it away but go to episode or go to live stream number 145 haunted houses dogman nature of reality and you'll see what i'm talking about the guy and his friend were, were talking and he had tossed a grapefruit up in the air and his friend reached out to catch it. When he did, he saw that blurriness. You know what I'm talking about? We talk about it on the episode. And then his friend's hand just froze and the, and the, the grapefruit hit his friend's hand and it just flopped down onto the ground. And he realized that his friend was standing there kind of frozen. But he was, if he observed him for a second and he noticed that he was barely moving. He wasn't standing still. He was just kind of barely moving and his hand was just slowly inching backwards. And then all of a sudden time went back to normal and his friend was like, oh, I guess I was too slow. And he was like, did you see what just happened? And his friend, whose name is David, was like, no, what are you talking about? He goes, dude, your hand, you were frozen. And the grapefruit hit your hand and he goes, come on, man, you're going to try and tell me about this house being haunted, blah, 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 blah. Well, funny thing, a couple of days later, his friend sees a full-bodied apparition. Well, actually, I can't call it a full-bodied apparition because it was only like half of a person moving through the kitchen. And he said it looked like a, a person that was dressed kind of like in, like in a maid's outfit, like, you know, how they, like somebody who's like a servant or whatever. And this big, big Victorian-style house that they lived in, like I had said before, it was like 11,000 square foot, some crazy uh, square footage. And so they did have servants at one time at that house. And so he thought, you know, this is, this is crazy. What did I just see? So then before his friend left to go back to Maine, he tells him, your house is haunted. There's something going on in your house and I don't want to come back here. And then he says, well, I told you about the grapefruit. He goes, I don't know what to think about that. I, he goes, all I saw was, you know, you standing there smiling. He goes, but when I started thinking about it, it looked like your your face was moving in slow motion, but it was only for a split second. So his friend noticed it too, but I guess until he saw that ghost, he kind of like um, rationalized it. Yeah. But then he started thinking about it as he was getting on the plane. He was like, "No, nah, man, something's going on here. This is, you know, this is weird." He should have uh, definitely felt that grape hit his hand or something. Well, he did. Okay. But he thought he had just missed it, like it bounced off of his hand. So, I don't know. That's just weird. It's, it's, it's definitely puzzling. You know, it's one of those things where it's like, I feel like I would notice if, you know, I was trying to catch a grape and all of a sudden it's on the ground. Grapefruit. 
Grapefruit? Uh. Well, I mean, to him, it was like he just went and it bounced off his hand. Like, he was too slow to, to, to wrap his hand around. That's why, I mean, that's why it's so strange yeah. to me because, like, you would think, like, he, it would be like a lapse. Like, something would quickly jump and, like, he would notice the jump. But to him, everything was just normal. So, it's like, how do you even try to explain that to someone else and, like, in that same scenario where, like, you know, let's say, like, me, Anthony, and Wolf are here. All of a sudden, Wolf is like slowed down, and me and Anthony are looking at each other and talking and stuff, and all Wolf just comes out of it. How are you supposed to explain, like, hey, I just spent like the past five seconds going super speed or going super slow? Like, how do you, how do you explain well, any of that? Here's what's weird, guys. Like, most of the stories, except for with the exception of two, I got a couple, and, and, and I don't know if I have time to tell them, but what's really weird about this. And and, and, I, and I don't know how to rationalize it in any, I just can't. It seems to only happen with like the exception, I have several stories like that, but only two stories, only two that I could find where it happened where one person was going in slow motion and other people around them noticed it. All the other stories are one person is is going normal and everybody around them is stopped or slowed down. So what is happening here? Is is it possible that any one of us could this happen to any one of us? I well, mean, I have an idea. I have an idea on how these people's perception of time is being altered, not why, but I believe the that our perception of time is tied directly to how we perceive the fluidity of motion. Like, have have you ever noticed how when you're trying to swat a fly, it's almost impossible. And it, it seems like no matter how agile and quickly you can move, you know, if you're trying to swat it with your hand, it, it's always got a leg up on you. I think that's tied directly to, to how that fly perceives your motion. It's perceiving you at a much higher frame rate than you're perceiving it. So from its perspective, you're actually moving in slow motion and it has time to react mm. because it can see you at, at a much at a higher frame rate than you can see it. But from, from your perspective, you're moving as fast as you can. Uh, like, have you ever seen those Pixar movies or, or Disney movies where the main characters are, are like really tiny, and then he, here comes this big shoe from a from a, oh, yeah, from yeah, a human yeah, being, and they're always down. moving in slow motion? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I believe that's a real thing, and I, I think it's a survival mechanism for smaller creatures, for, sm uh, for smaller living things. But somehow, maybe that's a latent ability in our brains that, for, for reasons beyond my understanding gets unlocked at certain points in time. You think it's like in high threatening situations, even like let's say something happens in the supernatural, like in the spiritual world where like they can sense it and they're immediately put into that most intense like survival mode where they're like, I, th my whole body is trying to just figure out a way to get out of whatever is happening right now. Yeah, I do believe that. Yeah. Because fighters will, will, will have that same, uh, that same experience when you're fighting someone, even if it's in a uh, in a controlled like professional context, your body it still believes that it's going to die. Yeah, you know, like it doesn't know you're fake fighting. Yeah, so that that survival mechanism kicks in. Mm -hmm. Well, but I don't know why it would kick in just at random moments in these stories. I you know that's that's beyond me. I just I yeah, have an idea that's, as that's to how, weird. but not why. I also think it's very important that me and Wolf find found out now that you're just too slow to catch flies. Like, me and Wolf don't have that problem. I don't have that problem at all. It's nice to know that you admit that. We don't catch flies because you eat them. We still catch them. <laughs> <laughs> Protein. <laughs> I can say this. We're I've never eaten a fly on purpose. <laughs> Maybe when I was in Africa, I ate one on accident. <laughs> I think I did, actually. I was on a train and something flew into my mouth. <laughs> and I was like, and then, and then I, get, I get back to the States and I read about some kind of... Uh, mind like bugs that were like in Africa that place where we were at and they were like that they were go like people were eating like like getting them in their ears or something oh, or in your mouth yeah. and I can't remember what they were called but they actually would 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 Alter. mess up your brain yeah. yeah and then people were having like all kinds of memory problems and stuff like that and speech problems obviously that's not my problem I can yeah. remember a lot of stuff and I could talk but <laughs> I just thought, dude, I hope I didn't eat that because I was sitting there kind of looking over the side of the train. I wasn't even moving that fast. And, uh, and I was like, oh, oh, uh, oh. Uh. And then I was next to this Russian guy and he was like, oh, it happens. Bug and fly in mouth and sometime you choke. He goes, good thing you didn't uh, go into lungs. I was like, yeah, thank, thank goodness. But I swallowed something. 
Um, but yeah, that was a long time ago. The word that satori, if if you look it up, it's a Japanese word, and it, it's a, it's a Bud- Japanese Buddhist term for awakening, comprehension, or understanding, and it refers to understanding the nature of our reality. Um, it's also weird that the name satori in folklore, in Japanese folklore, is also a name for these creatures that are like mind reader, like like they're monkey like demons that can read your mind, which is really weird. Now, if you if you talk about demons or the the jinn or any of these creatures, these you know, they always have this ability to be kind of one step ahead of us, and. I've heard it said before, I was reading the something about a Sufi mystic, I think it was David Weatherly me that had talked about this, and that it, th- this guy had written some stuff, and I got to talk to David to get his name, but it was somebody that David knew. And one of the things that, that I remember reading was him talking about how th- the reason that these entities are always one step ahead of us is because they can move quickly through time and space where we are like moving like we're stuck in mud. You know, yeah. and so every now and then, maybe one of us gains like a short term Satori level of enlightenment where you actually, you know, experience the true reality and where there is no time, there is no space. And maybe what happened with Gus when he ended up on the ground was it was too much for him, mm-hmm. you know, and I do believe that he did do what he said he did. Uh, he seems like a very credible guy. He doesn't seem like he wants to make up anything. Um, now, when I talk about how I get stories and I get the whole enchilada, get this. Gus's sister is a lifelong abductee. He doesn't believe or, or think that he's ever been abducted. But one time when he was out hunting uh, in eastern Oregon, uh, up in this lake up near the mountains, that he actually saw a Bigfoot. He was he was tracking an elk that he had shot, and he was trying to to to, to get it, you know. And he sees this big bigfoot type creature, about nine foot tall, just come out of the brush and grab it. And so, what started off as a bigfoot story that he had given me, it was a bigfoot story, and I met him through one of the groups. And of course, yeah, that particular group, I was chastised recently for saying, are you sure about that? That got me uh, a strike and told that if I offend anyone again, I will be booted from the group. And I'm like, all you have to say is you're sure about that? Jeez. Kindergarten internet. Yeah, that's that's awesome. And and so I was kind of laughing with two or three of the other people that I'm in that group. And we kind of, you know, w- one of the girls that I'm friends with, uh, she was like laughing. She was like, that's all it takes? <laughs> it's like to get a warning, you know? Because I was like, so I told her and, and Phil, I was like, this is this is all it took to get in trouble. But anyway, I met this guy and he he told me this Bigfoot story. Um, and and it wasn't like I said, it wasn't real long. He gave me a description of the creature, and I'll get into it real quick. It was a chocolate brown color. Um, it did have canines, he could see it, and it was only about 50 yards from him, and he was looking through his scope, and uh it looked right at him, and it didn't do telepathy, so to speak, but it did kind of like tell him, this is mine. And he was just like, okay. <laughs> and the elk wasn't even completely, uh, it wasn't done. And the Bigfoot unalived it. And then that was the end of it. And then it took it. And he was like, he went back and he told his wife, he was like, you're not going to believe what just happened to me. So that was about, I think, six months before um, he had had this weird satori like experience at the Trulux um, down in downtown Austin. And he did tell me, though, that, that and, I, and, and this is going to be interesting, um, his friend, I think his name is Joseph, he's had several experiences with a haunted house down in South Austin. And I thought, oh, I'm very uh, adverse. I, mean, I know about that. You know, I'm very versed in all that. I could tell you right now about haunted houses in South Austin. So he's going to give me his story, and I thought, man, that might be something good for the show or for my next book. But um, either way, it's going to be cool to talk to him because where he lived was not that far from where I lived. It was only a couple miles um, down near Slaughter, and he moved into a house and had all kinds of stuff happen. So, you know, it's weird how you just meet somebody in a group and then they give you a story. And if I would have just taken the Bigfoot story, I wouldn't have this story to tell about this possible alternate reality, 
whatever, you know? Um, that's really interesting the way you said that. Um, it's like we're slowed down or whatever. Cause if you think about it, like, we obviously, I have obviously no way to confirm it, but I would assume that a spirit sees time way differently than we do. And that one of the things about us being physical is that it's like, it's taking away all that like extra information and forcing you to be into like where you live in the moment where like everything you feel, you feel directly because it's happening to you like right now Mm -hmm. where like we have a bigger concept of time because of our physical bodies. So like the reason why they just, they're like suddenly just taken into this, um, slow time or stop time kind of thing is like, maybe it's just they're sp- like, they're, they got real connected to their spirit real quick and like their spirit left their body real qu- their, uh, or something or, or like their physical body. Just maybe the spirit took over, which took is a higher self. Yeah, yeah exactly. That- so then they were immediately elevated into a time where they were like, okay, this feels weird. But in reality, it's just like, that's how it always is. That's how like spirits see us. It's just like, we're, Moving, moving so slow, slow. we're That's just completely exactly what stopped I was about time. to say. Yeah, yeah. Because, sure, you were. Yeah, because spiritual. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I did say it right, Tony. <laughs> well, finally, you got something right. Oh, okay. Thanks a lot, but, Tony. <laughs> it makes sense though, uh, because spiritual beings vibrate at a higher frequency mm-hmm. than we do, and um, perception of time. I, I also believe is tied tied directly to how quickly uh, you, you move or vibrate because that there have been experiments where a fighter pilot will synchronize his watch with, with someone on the ground mm-hmm. and their watches are exactly set at the same time. Uh, the pilot will get into one of these, these jets that breaks the sound barrier. It, it travels faster than the speed of sound. And then when they land in the exact <clears> same <throat> spot, that their watches are, are not synchronized anymore, that they're differently. I mean, they're off. So Same you know, thing happens in space. Yeah. Yeah. Spiritual beings, their vibration is higher, so their the way they move is going to be quicker. Not only do they have the ability to think be, uh, beyond a human mind, but they have more time to think. You know, yeah. I mean, a, a, everything about everything about them is going to be faster than what we perceive. Yeah, but I think that's like that's our gift is that you know we're able to take that time to slow down. You know, I think it, it may it might look like we're falling behind or we're sl- we're like slowed down to everybody else. But if you really think about it, we're able to perceive and accept things a lot better. And I, I think it's because we're forced into like this quagmire where everything we go through, we kind of just have like a very timetable like substance of it where I feel like spiritual beings go through like a thousand things at the same time and they don't realize it all or they can't like they comprehend it really differently than how we would because we have a physical body and because we are, we have these limitations that we're forced on. And I think it's like probably one thing why they're jealous about and like one thing why they're trying to be, get a physical body or something like that. It might be like that it, because it's an advantage that we're not taking advantage of because we don't realize it. Yeah. Because kind of we can appreciate, but we can appreciate a lot more, in, in let's say like a hundred year lifespan than they can because a mm-hmm. uh, hundred hundred years of our time for them that that's who knows how short that actually is that could be like happening all the time to them because we don't understand how they're like being in a fourth density means that you we, we just have no concept of how their timetables work you know yeah and I think like that's one thing that we could definitely say is an advantage of ours that I think people need to stop like focusing so much about what they can do and be like hey we have some cool stuff too that makes us powerful. Here's something interesting. If you've ever watched uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula, or if you've ever read the book, I've I've done both. Crossed oceans of time to be with you. Well, no, or? no. Actually, it's uh, the dead travel quickly. Oh mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. And Jonathan Harker, I believe it's like in the beginning. I think it's th- toward the beginning of the book. Uh, he basically says that it's it's Bram Stoker, and he quotes. Den die Toten uh, Ritten Schnell, which is actually, it's saying the dead travel quickly. Uh, where that comes from is actually uh, Gustav August Berger. Um, and I don't remember what year. It was in the 1700s. Go look it up, folks. Anyway, it, it's, it's, a, it's called Lenore. It's a ballad. Mm-hmm. And I remember that w- reading about that when I was like in, in high school, when I was 
in a particular facility. I had a lot of time. So I was like, I, I did the, the, and I had a teacher that was actually gave a crap and, and was a literature teacher. And he gave me all kinds of books to read. He would bring them uh, from an outside library and he trusted me enough to let me, you know, and when I went over that, I asked him if that was a true Romanian saying. I was all 16 years old. And this particular teacher um, was nice enough to tell me uh, where that came from. And then he said that it was from that that particular, you know. And so I wrote that down in one of my journals years ago. And I thought it was very uh, telling that the Ahova, my, you know, Arthea used to talk about how the dead can travel fast. Um, it was creepy when she would say that, especially in Spanish. And it's just like, you know, one time I, I remember, and I told you this, Anthony, you remember I told you I was sitting there all of eight years old eating breakfast cereal and she sits down at the table and asks me if I saw the dead. Yeah. You remember that? Yeah. <laughs> Cause she was very, she's like, mijo, I'm sitting there like, like literally like eating, you know, like, like. Captain Crunch or whatever cereal it was, you know. Yeah, I can just visualize you just munching down on Captain Crunch. Like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mijo, do you see the dead? And, and like your mouth just stops. Like, and I was what? like, so I called my mom and I was like, mom, Dia's acting weird. You know, so my mom was like, Mijo, she just likes to talk about weird stuff, you know, whatever. Don't be afraid. She's just, just that way, you know. And uh, of course, you know, her, her, her mother, which was, she was full of Comanche. And, and so whenever, whenever I, uh, you know, my tia's mom, whatever, my great grandmother, and she would try to talk to me and she would sing to me in Spanish, you know, and Spanish wasn't her first language because she was Comanche, but I just remember her like always combing her hair. She had never, never uh, cut her hair. Um, and your mom's, we've talked about her before and she would sit me on her lap and she was so old that her, uh, you know, all I felt was the bones of her legs. And it was kind of, it kind of, it kind of freaked me out, dude. And she would read to me the Bible in Spanish, which I didn't understand a lick of it. And then one day I remember just waking up and I look over and she would roll these home rolled cigarettes and she would only smoke once a day. And it was always at the same time, about four or five in the morning. And she had this rocking chair and I look up and all I see is the red bud of this cigarette. And and I remember, and she she was ninety seven officially when she died, but I think she was even older because when they found when the, the 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 military found her, they thought she was a toddler because she was so malnourished. But think she was already like seven years old, so they said that she was like three. That's pretty crazy. Like that's how starved starved they were. Um, but she was sitting there and she was you know smoking this, and she asked me a question. In Spanish, which I didn't understand, which translated to, um, do you see the dead? And if you do, don't be afraid. And I'm not going to try and repeat all that in Spanish because, first of all, we don't have time. And plus, I'll probably butcher it. But anyway, my great aunt, the next day, I didn't know what the heck she had said. So I guess she reiterated it to me at breakfast. Um, and I was like, what is this about? Well, apparently, they had a spirit that lived in their attic and I hated to go up there and I had to go up there a couple times with me and your cousin, Paul Anthony who passed away. We were staying there one summer together. It was me and him for about a week or whatever. And we had to help them move some stuff up into the attic, you know, like boxes of Christmas ornaments or something from the garage into the attic because whatever. And for some reason, her and my mom just love moving stuff from one place to the next. Kind of, kind of like, like an exercise of futility, but if you ask me, but we did it. And I remember us hearing like somebody clear their throat. Now it wasn't anything else that happened, but when I came downstairs, we were both freaked out and scared and we didn't want to go back up there. And so I think that they asked, they were asking me if I'd seen it. So then she puts the rosary in my hand and says the prayer in Spanish with me and put holy water above our bed. And then that was it. Nothing else happened. Of course, I was like eight. I think Paul was like 10, something like that. Um, it, it was uh, it was a little creepy thing, you know, but uh, that is something that Thea told me one time. She, we were on our way to San Juan with your grandmother, Susie. And I remember her saying, the dead travel quickly in Spanish. And I was like, wait, what? And my mom's like, don't be saying that. You know, he understands and he's going to get scared or whatever. Which I, 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 I was already freaked out enough by everything. I didn't, I wouldn't get, what, what else can there be? You know what I mean? Until I saw the dog, man, I thought, you know, 
there's ghosts. We know that. And then I saw the dog, man. And I'm like, what the heck, man? What else is out there? And now we know. Um, but folks, that's all the time we have for today. Thank you for tuning in uh, for tonight to, on this beautiful Tuesday night. Uh, we're, we're so uh, glad that you could make it and that you tune in and listen to the show. All of you who are on uh, Spotify and the other Apple and the other different uh, podcasts or whatever, go check out the live streams on YouTube. You won't be disappointed if you can get through you know, my maniacal, egotistical ramblings, as one person put it, but they keep watching because they can't look away. Well, you have me on the show, so I have to do that. <laughs> <laughs> this guy goes, you can't look away. It's like a train wreck, man. Well, thanks for the views, buddy. I'm glad that train is wrecking and you're able to witness it because uh, it helps us. So thank you very much. We'll see you, what, Friday? At the conference. No, that's mm. next week, man. Oh. What are you talking about, bro? Well, I'm saying the conference is crazy, also coming. Bro. But. <laughs> <laughs> so the conference, we'll, we'll, we'll embed that in the description, right? Where yeah, you can go yeah, get definitely. your tickets or you can just show up and then pay your ticket there at the door. September 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. It's going to be on. It's going to be lit, bro. All right. Is that is that even, is that still something people say? Is it lit? They still say that or is that old? Yeah, occasionally. Occasionally. Yeah. Okay. It's going to be live. So anyways, we'll see you at the conference. Thanks for tuning in and good night.